so sorry. I know this is exactly what everyone expects from the opener to a Blair Witch Project podcast, but it's it's just such a cliche. We thought it would work. Well, I thought it would work. I'm just so sorry to Matt's mum, sorry to Luke's mum. Honestly, thought it would work. What? Now I'm recording the intro. Of course I'm not doing Heather's speech, it's a f***ing cliche. Hi everyone, welcome to The Cutting Room, the movie show by All The Right Movies. I'm Luke, and I'm here with Westy. Hello. And Matt. Hello. On today's show, we've got a true sensation on our hands, and not just the talent that you see in front of you either. (laughs) Today we're talking about the end of the century game changer, ultra low budget, found footage folk horror flick, The Blair Witch Project. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Matt, I'm coming to you first because I know you're being desperate to talk about this one. Mm. Why are we Half talking about the Blair Witch Project? Still on the edge of his seat, look. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm petrified just thinking about it now. Don't stick his head out of the tent. <laughs> uh, why Blair Witch? I think you have to give respect to any film that effectively creates a genre like this one did. And I know Cannibal Holocaust came before a few years ago and maybe some others, but none of them were the huge crossover hit phenomenon that this was and yeah. Yeah. for anyone who was, who was born after this any of like our younger viewers who weren't around when this came around it was genuinely a phenomenon it took everyone by surprise and it was just the one film everyone was talking about that year so we'll go into the marketing in a bit more detail later on but for now all i'll say is i was quite obsessed with this film back in the day because mm. i was in my second year at university and i know this is going to sound a bit bizarre in this day and age but back then Internet access was quite limited, so the idea of having it at home <laughs> was really only for rich people. So I only had the internet when I went to university, which right. is when, you know, discovered things like IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes and loads of other film forums, which, you know, I was straight into. Yeah, and through those, things, I just obviously. started to hear. <laughs> <laughs> few other things. Yeah. few other things, you know. But we'll say that for, uh, when we revisit Boogie Nights. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> but it was through these forums that I started to hear about this film that was so terrifying and it was mm. driving audiences mad and it was driving people mad because it was true. And even though that aspect didn't last too long, by the time it came out over here, everybody knew, no, it's not true. They're alive, they're fine, it is fake. It yeah. didn't really matter to me. I still just had to see it. And so, you know, did the expectation live up to the hype? You know, we'll, we'll find out later on, I guess. But yeah, at the time, Wonderful. it was a big, big obsession of mine. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. What about you, Westy? Yeah, pretty much the same. I was working at the cinema when this came out in 99. And I remember walking down the corridor and seeing the, the teaser poster for it, you know, mm-hmm. and it was just that blurb in 1994, three yeah, college yeah. students went out. And the year later, their footage was found. And it was like, oh, <laughs> Yeah. that sounds really good Fantastic. that looks really good that's like everything i have love about horror movies like it's there's something different with this and it just felt even just from that post that it just felt really fresh and something that you didn't necessarily want to say but you felt you had to say it was kind of mm. like classy's 80s horror films you know when you were a kid and you're like i don't want to say this but i kind of have to I have to it yeah had that vibe about it where there was just this necessity to see what was going on with it and that really hit home with me and we'll get on to it when we're talking about the invention of the viral market and having all the genius behind all that later on but yeah, yeah it just really struck me and i'm a big big fan of of movie imagery and movie posters and this for me is one of my very very favorites so from the from the get-go i, I needed to see it it was a need to see Brilliant. Yeah, I think the three of us, we wanted to talk about this for a long while, and yeah. now we've finally got our chance, probably because we didn't put it to revolt. <laughs> we've just <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> given lost every it. time. Yeah. <laughs> just us three voted for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah 100%. Landslide. Landslide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it coming out. I remember the stories about it and the hype surrounding the supposed true story. Mm-hmm. When I finally watched it, it was one of those films that I, I, I knew was an instant classic. Mm. It subverted audience perception of the medium to mainstream audiences. It was a new type of horror film, and it tapped into the power of the internet as well, which you fellas have said, yeah. and it scared the living shit out of me. Yeah, That's yeah. why we're talking about it. Yeah. yeah. So we've got our tents ready, our success rice packed, <laughs> and we're headed into the Burkittsville Black Hills Forest to talk about the Blair Witch Project. Let's go. In the small town of Burkittsville, Maryland, student filmmakers Heather, Josh and Mike head into the woods to document the folklore tale of Ellie Kedward, a woman who was banished to the woods for witchcraft in the 1700s and later became known as the Blair Witch. 
Unable to find their way out of the woods, Heather, Josh and Mike fall foul of the supernatural forces that play around them as they spiral into a psychological nightmare. Written, directed and edited by Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez. Produced by Greg Hale and Robin Cowie for Hacks and Films and distributed by Artisan Entertainment, The Blair Witch Project stars Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard and Michael Williams. So on The Cutting Room, we talk about the key elements of the filmmaking process. That changes episode to episode depending on the film. Here we're talking about the directors, the writers, the cast, and we're pulling out our very own personal highlights before individually rating the film out of 10. Yep. Yeah. First up are the directing team of the Blair Witch Project, Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez. A first time directing gig for Merrick and Sanchez. What do you think of their work as directors here? It's hard to distinguish between the direction and the writing mm. and what's ad libbed and what isn't and what's actually shot choices and what isn't because it is very, very original in its approach to filmmaking. It, it's not conventional in any stretch. It's one of the most original and really inventive films that I'd seen at that, up to that point. Mm. It was just very much of its own accord. And I find it really hard because every time I'm normally really good with kind of directors, cinematographers, and I remember them, but I can never remember these guys' names. It just seems to be like the, it's all encompassing. Like I can never, even though if the actors weren't using their real names, I wouldn't, I wouldn't remember them. I don't think it yeah. just seems like it's yeah. this thing that they've created and they can't really, they couldn't really better it. They couldn't come out of it. It just created such a phenomenon that I think it was just such a solid idea, but it's the, it's the execution, which way, where then they're going to need, you know, real kind of big up. And it's this, just this inventiveness and having this, like I always say that I appreciate just this real confidence to go out and go, there's some notes, mm-hmm. go out and do this. Mm-hmm. If there's a boom box yeah. playing kids' voices, there's just, you know, really shaky camera work. Mm-hmm. There's so many objects that throw you watch. There's, there's so much iconography of witches and witchcraft and how the, all the female characters are portrayed and they all look quite dark hair, dark eyebrows, pale skin. Even when they're getting interviewed, there's some really creepy people getting interviewed, some yeah, creepy great. guys getting interviewed where it's massive close-up. It just leaves it on the surface and kind of leaves it open and you journey in with them. The first yeah. scene, the shoots at the cemetery and then they're taking the piss out of supernatural elements. She will cut her fingers open and bleed on it. She will, Bad stuff. And it's all a joke yeah. to them. Mm. And they Therefore, you just there's a foreboding under that. Even the titles of this film, I love titles. And when that <laughs> original logo comes up, it's just shaking the whole thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, all the titles yeah. are shaking. The Blair the Witch Hacks Project film it's thing, Hacks and film, yeah. and it looks yeah. like almost kind of like a, a like a, a witch kind of figure itself. You know what I mean? Like a scythe or something. It's really creepy. And it's in, in that Hacks and films. It's like when the Geffen logo comes up at the start of Beetlejuice, and you've got that soundtrack, and it's like, whoa, <laughs> this is a bit out there. There's no cast, there's no crew, even from that point of view. There's no music, mm. there's nothing. So you're watching these credits thinking, what is this? Like, have they just they've put that on there? But everything's been thought through. Everything's very meticulous. There's some really great cross cuts and some really great flashes of white when they shouldn't be just to throw the audience off. And from a directing point of view, I don't know because I don't know how much was actually directed because I, I don't <laughs> right. think they're sitting there going, do this, do that, do the other, which is what a classic director would do. No cut, do that again. But from a filmmaker's point of view, writer, director, editor, both of them, yeah. a complete package for me, I think absolutely brilliant. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, well, I think the direction pretty much is the film. You mentioned yeah. the, 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 the lines are blurred between the direction and the writing because the directions in the writing, in that treatment that they record, that they wrote for, for the actors to follow mm-hmm. and the notes that they gave them about the character's motivation. And I think the thing that is so effective is that classic trope of what you don't see. The Blair Witch yeah. of the film is as much a myth as the legend itself, really. We never see any evidence of, of her. Yeah. What we do have is a very effective use of sound, those distant child's voices and those cracks of foliage. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and great acting to create the illusion, the illusion in your mind's eye that you do actually see the Blair Witch at certain points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Usually in horror films, the final third lets the film down with the reveal of the monster because it just looks crap. That yeah. dreadful Pennywise spider at the end of the It miniseries yes. TV show yeah. from 1990, yes. for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. with a budget this low, it would almost certainly have undermined the power of the film if they, inte- if they attempted to put the Blair Witch on screen. Mm-hmm. For me, anyway. Mm-hmm. There's this moment where the running like maniacs out of the tent and into the woods after the, uh, the tent starts shaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Heather screams, what the fuck is that, in the woods? But we never see anything, which in my mind's eye, I thought we did. 
but upon yeah. revisiting it, we don't at all. <laughs> oh my god, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? But it wasn't the original intention. The art director, Ricardo Moreno, was dressed all in white. White long johns, white stockings and white tights over his head. Mm. And the cameraman was supposed to pan over <laughs> to capture him. But he forgot to. And Heather didn't know this was going to happen and her response is genuine. And you can really feel it. It's blood curdling. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. And on top of the concept, writing and the execution of the film, Merrick and Sanchez really put the cast through the ringer by silently stalking them as they went deeper into the woods for eight days, leaving them stage direction in note form, which they found by GPS day by day. So to say that Merrick and Sanchez were instrumental in the success of the film is an absolute understatement. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the performances from the cast owe a lot to it, but the directors drew that performance out of the actors because of their onset antics, because they deprived them of food as the days went on and they were responsible for those sound effects and the distant voices in the woods, and the cast re- weren't anticipating that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what I think adds to the power of the film are the moments of deep blackness where you're desperately trying to find images in the dark, where, mm-hmm. particularly when they're in the tent. Yeah. And the imagery is so strong and lasting from the film, the piles of rocks and the wooden effigies hanging from the trees. Yeah. Although they, they sound quite unassuming and a little bit pathetic, but mm. like they really stand out as eerie symbols in horror, in horror movie history. I have no idea. And not the first of its kind, but found footage movies date back to the 60s, a film from 61 called The Connection about heroin addicts is considered the first foray into the medium. The most commonly found in the horror genre, though, disgusting, splatterfest, cannibal holocaust from 1980 that you yeah. mentioned earlier, Matt, is regarded mm-hmm. as the first found footage horror film. And if you can avoid that one, I definitely would. Yeah. It's horrendous. <laughs> Lost Watch broadcast it the other night. Well. Lots of, yeah. That's another one. Yeah, last broadcast that last came broadcast. out the year before. Uh, the Blair Witch, and it's similar in narrative, a bunch of filmmakers go into the woods and are attacked by an unknown presence. So yeah. it's not the first found footage horror film, but much like Halloween in the slasher genre, it's the one that popularized it. Yeah. So I think what Merrick and Sanchez have done with The Blair Witch is made a film that changed the game, changed the way horror movies were made. Before The Blair Witch Project, there were roughly 10 found footage films mm-hmm. in existence, the whole of cinema history, well yeah. over 100 years. In the 23 years since its release, do you know how many they've been made? Five hundred. Yeah, Scott said, "Got to be in the high hundred, doesn't <laughs> yeah. it?" Yeah, it's it's over one hundred and fifty found footage wow. films. Yeah, in it's comparison, a, yeah. ten to one hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah, hundred so of them films... are paranormal activity, aren't they? <laughs> 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 and that wouldn't have been made. Cloverfield, Creep, Host yeah. would just wouldn't exist without the play, which game changer Wreck. completely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, what do you think of the direction of the film? Mm. I can't think of anything comparable, to be honest, because mm. once they did this, literally no one else could ever do it again. Yeah. And you could take any film you want. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, many you times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you could take any other highly rated film you like, Apocalypse Now, Taxi Driver, Chinatown, whatever, and essentially you could remake those. I mean, they wouldn't be very good, but no. essentially you could redo them, but you can't remake this, mm. not to the extent that they did, not to the extent where they fooled people and thinking, shit, this is real. Yeah. Mm. And they just spotted that opportunity and pulled it off to such an extent that, like I say, no one else can imitate it, no one else can replicate it. And what they did was use the fact that they were absolute nobodies to their perfect advantage. Mm-hmm. This couldn't have been made by Sam Raimi. Toby nope. Hooper couldn't have done it. Wes Craven couldn't have done it. It had to be made by nobody. So that, that's part of the trick. It had to be these guys with no reputation whatsoever. And what they've done, I actually find really inspiring because it, it shows all you need is a good idea. And it doesn't matter if it's cheap, as long as it's good, which this is. And they ring every little bit of potential out of it. And it's a film that from a, a directorial point of view, I think they make so many brave decisions and all those decisions pay off, which is tribute to them. So to be very hands-off as directors, like we've said, to just leave the direction essentially in the hands of the cast, leave them out there in the woods, starve them, let them suffer under the animals. (laughs) Outrageous. Outrageous. But what's really great is because you can see that the actors are so exhausted by the end, you can tell actually, you know what, they've really bought into this vision that the directors have sold them. Absolutely. They've given themselves over to the directors. Yeah, totally. So to be able to con- convince three people to go out and do what they did, I think that's like tribute to how well they sold that film to them. Hmm. But what I think Myra and Sanchez really understand as well is what true fear is, because to me, that's what this film is. It's one of the best examples I can think of of showing you what true fear is like. 
and what it's like to be truly terrified out of your mind. Yeah. And I know this film is very divisive. I know some people absolutely hate it. We'll probably talk about that later. But I'm sorry, you can't tell me that waking up in the middle of the night to hear your friend screaming in pain somewhere in the distance. You can't tell me that wouldn't be one of the most terrifying things. I don't know if it's really him. I don't know if it's really him. They understand, like you say, Luke, what you don't see is often scarier than what you do see. The bravery to not show anything or really explain anything works so much in its favour. And yeah, it, it's strange because they started out as nobodies, had this massive home run with this and went back to being nobodies. But with their one shot they had in making a truly memorable horror film, I think they've produced something that you would put up there with films from the likes of William Friedkin and Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. Wow. And for that, they should be Big applauded. Praise. I think it's an incredible achievement what they did here. Big praise. Lovely. Yeah. Echoed. I know what you mean, Matt. Yeah, they could remake, you know, Chinatown and, and them by the classics yeah. because they had rules. They had building yeah, blocks. Yeah. This doesn't yeah, conventions. Yeah. This yeah, doesn't exactly. have any conventions whatsoever. And it's that fear of the unknown that gets me. Yeah. Its success was obviously influenced by the viral marketing campaign, which included listing the main cast as missing presumed dead on IMDB. The filmmakers handed out flyers at Sundance, encouraging people to come forward with information. Brilliant. I don't know. Like from Maryland to Sundance, why would they know information? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's it like doesn't... Paul Thomas Anderson saying that that longer cut of Boogie Nights is shit to the queue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's just you've got to fuel that. You've got to fuel yeah, that fire. Yeah. And going yeah. in, if I went into that and on in Sundance when no one knew anything about it, and I had a flyer with these mm-hmm. people missing, presumed dead, that film would be even more impactful, powerful, really yeah. powerful. Yeah. It was innovative in that it used the relatively new technology of the, the internet to create this myth, which many cinema goers bought into, that mm-hmm. the film was not fictional. With videos and photographs added to the authenticity of the myth, the website got 160 million hits by August 99, yeah. seven months after premiere at Sundance and only one month after its US release. Yeah. Which is amazing. When it take, would take yeah. you 45 minutes to get a dial-up signal. The amount of people who would have waited, <laughs> the patience. Yeah. So, Merrick and Sanchez, rookie directors, pulling off something quite extraordinary with the Blair Witch Project. Mm, Absolutely. Not a screenplay in the traditional sense of the word. The screenplay for the Blair Witch Project was a 35-page treatment, an outline of the narrative of the film, also written by Merrick and Sanchez. So what do you think of the writing on the Blair Witch Project, Matt? Three things stand out for me. First of all, it's the mythology that they managed to put in there. So that first 20 minutes, you hear yeah. Rustin Parr, Mary Brown. You get the stories from those two fishermen who are great. All of those two guys. Yeah, amazing. And it all sounds plausible. It all sounds yeah. like the stories you do grow up with if you live in these mm-hmm. small rural places. But I think American Sanchez also understand it's human nature to be scared of the woods and the right and place into that. If you think back to when you're a little kid and you get read traditional stories, how many of those about characters getting lost in the woods, like Hansel and Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood? It, it's yeah. like fundamental, like one of the earliest lessons you get taught. Don't go in the woods and get lost because there's yeah. something bad living in there. And I think the mythology taps into all that brilliantly. Second thing that stands out for me, I think the structure is brilliant. At first, you don't quite realize what's going on, but it's when you click like every time they go to sleep and put the tent up, something happens. And it gets progressively mm-hmm. worse and worse because that inherently builds up the tension. It gets to the point where they're like, we're going to have to pitch a tent. And you're like, oh, no, don't. Don't go to sleep. This is yeah, going to be bad. No, Something really awful fire. is going to happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, God, what's going to happen now? And then the last thing about the writing is just there's one of the ballsiest decisions I've ever seen in the film, which is to hang their ending on one line of dialogue that gets it early on in the film by mm-hmm. someone completely random. So he made one face into the corner. Really? And then he would kill the other one. Yeah. Because if you miss that line, if you've had a go to the loo or you've sneezed or you've just not paid attention, the ending makes absolutely zero sense. Mm-hmm. And that takes so much nerve to pull that off. And I know for a fact if I'd been making that film, I would have lost my nerve about that. I'd yeah. have gone, no, we should have a scene where they review all the footage so we can hear that line again so people remember it. But not them. They're going, no, we're going to hear it once. We're going yeah. to trust the audience are going to remember it and it's going to pay off that ending. So for me, that's just such a brave ballsy decision and that comes down to the writing as well so yeah in, in terms of writing it's not what we normally talk about but for what it is i think it's fantastically well done 
Yeah, very nice. What about you, Westy? Yeah, I'm the same. I think, you know, that line that you said there, Matt, but I watched it again and you notice it's very, very slightly up in the mix, the audio mix, yeah, right. when he says yeah, it, yeah, yeah. just so you've got to pay attention to it. Yeah, but yeah. there's some there's some great dialogue choices. I love the way that you're not just getting exposition from the people. It's more like their experience or what your grandma will tell you. But all the stories are actually building towards, like you said, what you're already going to see. You know, mm. don't get lost in the woods. Don't creep around the house. It was what my grandma used to tell her to keep her in bed so we wouldn't creep around the house at night or the play which will get you, which is exact foreshadowing of what actually happens. Yeah. You know, yeah. And there's all these little bits that are put in. I think some of the shot choices as well, even some of um, Heather's voiceover is really pretentious. But it's it's knownly pretentious because these are quite pretentious film students. But I do, I mean, I can't really think much of the dialogue because it does feel very much ad libbed, and I can't believe the treatment was thirty five pages. That seems really long for me. I would expect just like a ten pager, yeah. you know, or just yeah. written on cue cards. And how far was that acting? How far was that actually just genuine? So you know, it does raise a lot of questions and how they, you know, like we've already said, kept this believable and realistic and passionate all the way through. What did they write down? Because I do think the obscurity would have added to the performances. I mean, the writing, it's, I mean, it's a very linear, linear narrative, no complexities really, and character development is at a minimum, but yeah. it's not a Robert Altman film either, is it? No, it doesn't <laughs> no, want to be. No, no. <laughs> like it's as far removed from a Robert Altman film as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> For what it sets out to achieve, it hits the spot, 100%. What I really love at the start is that it is all exposition, all the lore and the character dynamics are laid out in the first 15 minutes. Yeah. All the Blair Witch stories throughout the centuries are told by the talking heads, mm -hmm. leaving the next hour or so for pure terror and tension building. And those stories of mutilation and child murder are so evocative, drenching dread over the leads. The deeper mm -hmm. they delve into the woods, they resonate. Mm -hmm. And it's classic horror trope stuff, really. A, a mythical legend, a night in the woods, going down to the basement. We've seen all of this stuff before, mm -hmm, but yeah. the backstory and the myth that they create is something that I think is really effective because we've all heard those kind of stories growing up. And usually the past off as nonsense, but with the fil the way the film has been made and written, like quote unquote written, I'm not surprised at all that people were taken in by it. Oh yeah, definitely. No, not at all. The dialogue in particular, I think it feels really authentic, and I think the reason for that is because it comes from a place of truth, because the treatment gave the cast carte blanche to basically improvise all of the dialogue in the film. Mm -hmm. mm. And this was based on reaction to what was going on around them. As we mentioned, the dirty tricks that Merrick and Sanchez pulled. But if you're eight days in the woods and being messed with, lack of food, it wouldn't yeah. take too long to lose grip on reality and for paranoia to take hold, even yeah. if you know that you're there specifically to shoot a film, yeah, a horror film. The yeah. mask would slip quickly, quite easily, because this yeah. legend of the Blair Witch is front and centre in your mind, which yeah. is the case for the cast they were under the impression that the legend was real and that the people that they were interviewing at the start were real townsfolk. Yeah, right. Understandable, because th those actors are great. The yeah, woman yeah. in the sunglasses with the disturbed child. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Get She's amazing. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's not it's real. It's not true. It is. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I'm going to bury him in the swamp. No, I'm not. Amazing. <laughs> 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 and shout out to Mary Brown as well, the crazy lady who claims mm. to have seen the Blair Witch. And she I mean she could be the Blair Witch. She's got yeah, a exactly. sunken face. Yeah. It was like a woman. Like <laughs> horse fur. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Like fur? Yeah, like a fur, like horse fur. So a simple but strong premise in the writing, which allowed the cast a lot of room to flex their improvisational skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The cast of The Blair Witch Project is probably the smallest cast list of any film that we've talked about. Aside from the talking heads at the start, the film only has three actors in the lead, narrowed down from a pool of 2,000 hopefuls who responded to a casting call in Backstage magazine asking for actors with strong improvisational skills. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard and Michael Williams were first-time actors and used their real names for their characters. Mm -hmm. We've each picked out a favourite here. Matt, would you like to take her away with your favourite? I would and I'm gonna go with Heather because I know she mm. is probably the most divisive element of the film. So what I would say about her performance is that with all due respect to people who, who don't like it, who disagree, you've got to appreciate what her performance is, which is it's not a performance, it's reality, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this for me is is probably the most convincing portrayal of someone who is just terrified beyond belief. 
and out yeah. of their mind. And yes, a lot of what happens in the film, you could say is her fault, dragging them into the woods, being mm -hmm. very stubborn that she knows the way when she doesn't really. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth bearing in mind she's one woman against two guys here. And I think yeah. the Blair Witch Project does make a subtle point that she has to be 10 times as assertive because of that. Mm -hmm. Because if she asks for help, she's going to look incredibly weak in front of them, which she can't do. And I think that explains so much of her behavior. But ultimately, I'm not interested in, in seeing a polished performance here from any of them, and especially not her. I don't care, actually, if I particularly like her or not. What I want is what Donahue gives me, which is just sheer hysterical sense of how terrifying it must be to be lost in the middle of the woods, no supplies, no way of contacting the outside world, and someone is intent on messing with you night after night after night, and they're not leaving you alone. Mm. So it's very easy to get annoyed by the performance. It's very easy to take the piss out of the famous apology scene, or to snot and all that. Okay, fine, but I don't care. That scene to me, it's one of the most disturbing scenes I've ever seen of someone who's accepted their own death is coming, and it's not going to be pleasant. So yes, I'll use the word again. It's a divisive performance, but for me, I think she's incredible, and I think it's an iconic horror performance from Heather Donahue. Boom. Nice. Have that, yeah. Heather Donahue detractors. Yeah, exactly. Stitch that. Yeah. Well, they always say <laughs> acting is reacting, isn't it? And that's kind of yeah. all that, that's all it is. It's reactions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. A lot of Fantastic. truth in that performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't need anything else from it. She won a Golden Razzie for Worst Actress for her Troubles yeah. as a performance as Heather, which harsh. 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 I'm sure there yeah. would have been worse performances. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's got to be put into context. Yeah. I've seen yeah, a of million worse performances. Definitely. Yeah. For example, Jamie Lee Curtis is worse in Halloween. Well, as we're talking about Heather Donahue here, fellas, we've got a question from one of our Patreon supporters. Okay. This one comes from Quiven McGee, and here he is to ask the question. Hi, lads. Um, I rewatched this film recently for the first time in years and found Heather to be pretty much unbearable throughout. So my question is, can you think of another film where the death of the main character is as welcome as it is here? Thank you very much for your question, Quiven. Lovely stuff. Mm -hmm. I must take issue. I think it's a bit harsh to say that Heather's death is is welcome here. Yeah, yeah, you know. I'd agree. But she is to blame for this nightmare. Mm -hmm. She led the group to her death. Obviously, she wasn't to know that, but, you know, it's her stubbornness and unwillingness to accept accountability. Doesn't really help her cause. No. Yeah, um, but I would say that my choice for a welcome demise in movies would be, and it's something that we talked about in the podcast at the turn of the year, mm -hmm. Ginger McKenna, Sharon Stone, Casino. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it might be a little bit harsh because there is a shred of redemption for that character in a final scene, but she is absolutely deplorable for two hours, mm -hmm. as most of the cast are in that film. But Ginger is a heinous leech of a character. She gets what she deserves when she gets pulled over by the police. When you think she's going to get away with it, so oh, yeah. that is quite satisfying. That because she yeah. thinks she's gone out of the bank. And and expertly played by Sharon Stone as well. Yes, brilliantly played. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What about you, Westy? You got one? I don't have one because it's a it's a dislike. I've kind of spun it the other way. It's where Ooh. it's again because I felt relief from Heather's death in this one. I feel relief from Paul Newman dying in Cool Hand Luke. I always feel a sense of he, he was too good for the world, and it kind of it it sticks the fingers up to the world and leaves me just a little bit. You know, he was just too good for it. And it's right. good that he got out of that mm. situation because he was never going to get out of that situation. He was never going to escape it. He was never going to escape the life he was given and the cards he was dealt and no one listened to him. I find relief at the end of that film. Very nice. An interesting spin on the question, yeah. Westy. Very as, nice. As always. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's straight down the line. That's per <laughs> yeah. Classy Westy. <laughs> what about you, Matt? Yeah, I've gone for someone who we've talked about this person on a podcast episode. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a masterpiece, but who isn't delighted when Franklin Fantastic. gets a belly full of chainsaw blade so he can finally stop whining, stop moaning, stop blowing raspberries, which are really annoying, stop eating disgusting looking bits of whatever the hell it is he's hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> illness. Illness. Sick. It's ill. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yeah, Franklin, I'm glad he gets killed. Yeah, yeah, I think me and Westy would echo that. Yeah, definitely, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I'll never tire of that moment that he crashes his wheelchair into the door for him. Though, classic, <laughs> sort of silently crying to himself. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay, Westy, which mm. character are you going to choose? Which one have you picked out? Well, I answered first, and I just went Josh because it's the only one I remembered because you hear his name about fifty times in the film. Yeah, because <laughs> it is yeah. shouted that many. I was like, uh, the character of the Blair Witch Project, Josh, obviously. No, but I, I do really like him as a character because he seems to be the most grounded. He seems to be the most mm. focused, and mm. the one that he he seems to have it figured out. It was his idea to go and to to go for you know. Let's find out where we are. Let's get grounded. He's the first person to know that they've just gone round in a massive circle. He's the one responsible for, you know, the technical side of it. He's checking his focus, which I always like someone who checks the focus, especially <laughs> on the way that we choose, which is very, very good. Great. But I like the way that there's that comparison between what he believes is right morally compared to what he should be capturing on film, the amount of times it says, should we be shooting this, should we not? Heather's just then pounding that home. Yeah. I like their backstory that they kind of have this little standoff in their personal relationship where they used to go out together, which just kind of touched on. It's not really explored very well. Mm -hmm. And I like that. It's just under the surface and it's just simmering. He's the first person to hear anything. He's the first person to notice anything. And his disappearance really, really impacts the film because you realize how much of a weight he was and how much he was holding the other two characters down because these guys are just go after that. They've got headless chickens. So I just really like the way he was just such a focused point of the group and you don't realize what you've got until it's gone. And I get that from that character, which is why I really appreciate him in this film. I think he's brilliant. Great. I like his reaction to uh, finding the slime. On yeah, on his, yeah. What the fuck is the blue jelly shit doing all yeah. over my shit? <laughs> Why the fuck? What the fuck was this blue jelly shit all over my shit? Well, I'm going to talk about sound man Mike, played by Michael Williams. He of sporadic chest growth. Chest hair <laughs> yeah. growth. Mm. Yeah. I do not like that close up of his disgustingly hairy nipple. That doesn't work out for me, that. It's horrible. <laughs> It's horrible. <laughs> you realise we're on YouTube now, so you have to show that. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah. Do. Here it is. I've got it. Yeah. There you go, guys. There's your nipple. Brilliant. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> Wouldn't get him Let's on PS3, would you? <laughs> you know, Let's uh, give it another turn. Here it is again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mike is a bit of a prick, really. Um, mm. He's overly aggressive towards Heather, which doesn't really sit well. Kicks that map right into the creek. He's probably yes, right when he says, yeah, he, th- he loves it. Yeah. He's probably right when he says that it was no help to them at all, but it was a symbol of hope for Heather. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like if I had the map, then maybe we could find our way out. And that hope's ripped away by his actions. Great scene in the immediate aftermath of that. The intensity ramps up and they're all fighting each other and screaming in desperation. Great performances really yeah. feel the truth in that. But there's something tragic about Mike. I think he, he's never met Heather. Um, he puts his faith in her, even though he doesn't fully trust her. He says that, mm-hmm. and it hugely backfires. And he's acting on pure fear when he starts lashing out. I suppose there's that great scene where they hear the noises for the first time. They go out into the tent, and he's not budging at all. He's staying in the tent. Yeah. I'm not going down there. I'm yeah. not going down there. Definitely not. I'd be yeah. the same. There's no way. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm I'm I know I'm here for this, but I, I, yeah. I'm not doing it. Yeah, I've got to draw the line somewhere. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't want my teeth pulled out. <laughs> what I like about Michael Williams' performance is his portrayal of the character's frustration at Heather's persistent filming. It comes up in quite a few scenes. He doesn't yeah. understand why she continues. They're supposed to be documenting the Blair Witch not being lost in the woods. Yeah, He is aggressive, but I think he traverses a range of emotions from hysteria to terror and all stops in between, and I think he does that very, very well. Mm-hmm. A good job. So like the writing, directing team, the rookie cast of Donahue, Williams and Leonard were instrumental in the film's success and put in great performances despite that Razzie award for Heather. Oh, yeah. Shame, shame. Yeah, unnecessary. Yeah. We're now going to pick out our own individual highlights from The Blair Witch Project, all of which take place in the third act of the film where the tension and paranoia really start to ramp up. Westy, Mm -hmm. over to you. Imagine if I said the opening shot or the opening sequence. That's the best yeah. bit of the Blair Witch Project, isn't it? No, it's definitely <laughs> no, not. No, no, no. We've, we've discussed how important it is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we've discussed how important it is to get to this point, and mine's kind of where it starts. I've just mentioned it when we talked about the cast, but it's when they wake up in the morning, they find the remains of Josh, and Heather mm. sees that them twigs. I'm just going to move them from outside the door of the tent and just yeah. throw them over there. That's yeah. that yeah. problem solved, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Fine. I'm gonna go, yeah, I'll go back 10 minutes and have a look properly once I'm just <laughs> over that. But that, I feel like that's what you would do. 
you like that's yeah. too close for comfort. That's, my, that's yeah. supposed to be my, my comfort zone. That's my that's my tent. That's yeah. where I'm sleeping. I'm just going to get that out of the way for now, and think mm. about it. But it's yeah. the reactions to that, realizing it's his shirt, realizing it's his teeth. It's the first blood you see in the film, and the blood so mm. visceral on that 16 mm. mil. It's obviously just they've enhanced that red, and it just it bleeds into the camera, and it's Heather's reaction off camera. It never cuts to anyone facial reactions you know it's like the camera doesn't pan around and you see no. mike and he's like <gasps> and you just comes around to heather and like filming herself or whatever you know that you would kind of expect from a found footage film now like you have to fill the gaps you have to fill that with reaction and all the reactions off camera and it's the reaction of the audience yeah. to realize that this guy is out of there mm. and there's some rocks over there and some twigs over there and you're still shit in your pants. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the turning point of the film for me, and it's just that point I'll always remember. It ju- it gets it escalates, which you guys are going to talk about from here. But I just remember that just snapping with me in the cinema, and I just thought, oh god. And that's yeah. when my heart dropped, and that's why I'll always remember this sequence. Just thought, mm-hmm. right, they're in trouble now, and I don't know where this is going. I could not guess where it was going at all. Yeah. See if maybe a nice kidney or something might have been a little bit more. A impactful. nice kidney, what wrapped yeah, in nice newspaper? Little kidney. Fish and chips, fava beans, <laughs> and a nice Chianti. A little three course meal outside, or a spleen or something like that. Spleen, something yeah, a little bit more yeah. sinister. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm going to go for the iconic and much parodied scene where Heather chooses an unfortunate camera angle to confess her sins and and make her apologies. The up nostril confession mm-hmm. scene. Yeah, what I really love about this scene. Yeah. <laughs> what I really love about this scene is that all along Heather's been the dominant force, courage in her convictions. This yeah. is going to be great. We're headed in the right direction. We're only a couple of miles from the cemetery. And it takes a good long while for her to admit that they're lost. And longer still to get to this part where she's apologizing to everybody's parents. Yeah. She's like the broken. opposite of an Oscar speech. Yeah. 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 I imagine this was her Razzie speech. You know, I want to apologize to everyone's family. It was my <laughs> fault. Sorry about the performance. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're in a situation like this where everybody has put trust and faith in your ability, you show strength because any sign of weakness, that would just ripple through the crew. Yeah. yeah and then course. it all crumbles down. She's the director as well, and she's full of it. And this is where she confesses what she's already known for. Yeah. The fate was sealed as soon as they stepped foot in them woods, really, meddling yeah. in things they don't understand. But there are two specific moments that I really like in her speech. The first is where she stops mid-speech and kind of looks away and says, what's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just Heather's brain is just frazzled yeah, and she's now yeah. delirious. And yeah. un- understandably, mm-hmm. she's hearing things. And it's the second moment, it's the more striking, after all of her apologies and snot and sniveling and all that, right at the end, her will has finally been ripped away and she pauses and says, I'm going to die out here. Yeah. And Matt, I mean, you're not going to choose the end credits. So what's your favourite? No. <laughs> what well, you got know. left? <laughs> and a lot of are horrible. Just that like yeah. industrial noise going on. Yeah, yeah, horrible. that's right. Yeah. yeah, no, but it is going to be then because I can vividly remember first time seeing this when Mike yells, oh, it's a house. It's a house. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my stomach oh, just dropped out. I was like, oh, no, not a house. I don't want to see a yeah. house. Anything don't go else. near that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely not. And it's brilliant location scouting because that ruin oh, and it yeah. was a genuine ruin it just radiates pure evil just looking <laughs> at it and i think it taps into something universal which is where wherever you've grown up rural or not isn't there always just some abandoned house somewhere near always. you always that oh, yeah. just has a bad vibe it doesn't have to be in the middle of the woods necessarily it could just be the end of a street somewhere because mm-hmm. i definitely remember from my childhood houses that were just always derelict and you just didn't want to go and just cross the road yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, the witch's yeah. house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And in the middle Every... of the day, now nah, I'm walking yeah. over the other side. Nah, yeah, I'm, I'm going totally... to go the other yeah. way. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, totally. Everyone had that grown up, and this taps into that. But then you get that final three minutes or so, which for me, it's just pure terror. And I feel like I'm being assaulted. Like every one of my senses is being assaulted from every angle because you've got the sound, which is Josh is yelling out for them somewhere in the house. Mike is yelling mm. in panic. He's gone charging off to find him. I, f- I think the way the switch between the two cameras here, really disorientating, yeah. especially because Mike's camera has the sound, so Heather's screaming yeah. all of a sudden. It's very distant. It's like, why, why is mm-hmm. that distant? I don't get it. The visuals of those child handprints on the wall, they're just yeah. so creepy. Yeah, and weird. Heather's screaming. 
I think by this point, she doesn't even sound human anymore. She's like a banshee or something like that. Mm. I think she has totally lost her grip on reality by this point. I think, yeah, she, she's gone, literally frightened yeah. out of her mind. And then you get to the end. And like I said in the writing, what a ballsy move to end this film on, to send the audience out, the scariest moment in the film, and it's just a man facing the corner of a room. Yeah. I mean, it shouldn't work. But no. it does. And for weeks after seeing this film, that was the one thing that just kept popping into my mind whenever I thought about it, when I was, whenever I was about to drop off. Oh, fuck, Mike, in the corner of the room. Yeah. <laughs> because when that realisation hits, that's why he's in the corner of the room. Oh, yeah. It's like a punch in the stomach. And then, yeah. boom, head this down. Film ends. Right? Everyone yeah. go home. Sleep tight. Good that, luck. That crunch of the noise <sighs> of the credits. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's the yeah. change of Mike's character in this sequence from mm. sitting in the tent, I'm not going down there, to yeah. I hear him upstairs, I hear yeah. him in the basement, come on, come on, come on, I yeah. hear him. Mm-hmm. And he just has this real kind of drive to nothing. Yeah. He's just really, he's there and he's passionate about getting there and then he's just silent. Yeah. It's so brilliantly done, that. Excellent. Yeah. Those screams, Heather's screams. Oh, oh yeah. Chilling. Fine. Yeah. yeah. There were three alternative endings shot after a test audience was be- bemused by what they saw in that original end and the one that is in the film mm. so they went back into the woods for reshoots i mean back into the woods forget about it yeah, no thanks. no yeah. no i'm not <laughs> yeah. doing that yeah. back yeah. to that house of doom no yeah. yeah and all the scenes are the same only the final image of mike in the basement changes yeah. one sees mike hanging by his neck in the corner mm-hmm. the second he's crucified on the wall and the third is where he's in the corner but facing heather as she comes in, suggesting that he was the aggressor all along, I suppose. Right. Okay. Right. Thankfully, they stuck with the ending because Mike, Mike facing the wall, it, thematically it fits because what yeah. you said, Matt, because yeah. what we were told by that guy at the start, kids facing yeah. the wall while he killed the other one. Yeah. And it looks ridiculous, the one way he's crucified on the, the, the twig Silly. thing. That's a thing oh. as well. It's what you don't see as opposed to mm, what yeah. you do. And you don't exactly. see a lot of Mike, and that's the genius of it. So yeah. seeing nothing. Not even seeing Mike's face is even better. Yeah. yeah. But it also plays into that another great theory where is there actually a witch? Is it because Josh had this relationship with Heather that didn't work out and he was just so sick of her shit that him and Mike, he basically got Mike involved. Mike didn't know Heather. Hmm. They went in the, out in the woods because he was jealous of her life or what she was going to do. So this whole thing was a ruse just to kill her in the style of Rustin Parr so that he could basically just have revenge on her ending the relationship, which you can see Mike running upstairs, taking Heather out the way, running all the way back down, telling her where to go. He stands mm. in the corner because he doesn't want to see Heather get killed. Mm. Josh pulls his own teeth out. That's why you don't get a spleen. That's why you don't get a kidney. That's why you just get a bit of oh, shame, shirt. Shame. So then what you say, it's all kind of maybe. Oh, yeah. And it's got all these different yeah. angles and all these different things to look into just based on these small little tweaks in performance and small little tweaks little in little details. Little details and just how, mm. how it all plays out. So you can look into it any way you want, really supernatural or just a revenge or just two mad guy like the end of Scream almost. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Getting away with it. <laughs> so three great scene choices from three great guys. All iconic moments in the horror genre. Finally. We're headed down to the basement of the Blair Witch Project to summarise our thoughts and score the film out of ten. Mm, I'll just stand in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Nervous. <laughs> so the big reveal end in Westie. Would you like to start with your summary and score? We've been through it, and there's just yeah. no denying the impact that this had on cinema, on the cinema landscape. This film cannot be repeated. You can't make this again. No. It has building blocks that cannot be copied. It, it's a completely original work and a completely impactful work. And whether you love it or whether you hate it, it had such an impact on cinema. Matt's put it up there with like, you know, Kubrick in that kind of stance of what he did, which I mean, it's fairly out outrageous. <laughs> but st- <laughs> fairly. <laughs> but still, I mean impactually for us we hadn't seen anything like it you know yeah. and that's probably the equivalent of people going to see 2001 where you ain't seen star wars why right, 2001 yeah okay whatever but this you kind of go wow okay this is com- something completely different and it's terrifying and it mm. hits your subconscious and you don't forget about this for years and years and years mm. and it stays with you and kind of shapes you a little bit so for a film to do that and stay with you for so long and have that much of an impact it can't be any less than a 10 10 Boom! Massive. Mm. Massive. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Mm. 
it's been a really interesting film to talk about and I'm glad we did it and I'm very certain we'll, we'll get comments below from people who hate this film and I oh, did yeah. get it because the thing is Blair Witch was a victim of its own success this actually shouldn't on the face of it have been the mainstream hit that it was hmm. it should have been one just played for the horror crowd other people should have discovered it on VHS or DVD back in the day it should have been a cool film that people just talked about and that's how you got to see it, it shouldn't have been the hit that it was mm. but the fact that it actually was that it tells you a lot about it it tells you how good that marketing campaign was how brilliantly executed this idea is by Myrick and Sanchez and how much those three actors put themselves through it totally to achieve complete believability and I know people get angry at the film because it wasn't what they're expecting. But for me, this does do what a horror film should do, which gives you pure fear. And it doesn't give you answers. It's just two guys who had this one idea and explored it brilliantly. And it just took off in a way that they never thought was going to happen. Yeah. So I think it's an important film. I think it's historic. It's got iconic performances and imagery in there. It completely works for me on a level that other horror films, which just have boom and soundtracks and dozens of jump scares, simply don't. I think it's a one-off. It's a film to be honest. I wish I had had this idea to make it because it's <laughs> such a great idea. And to be able it to say, is. I pulled that off. That's incredible. I, I do think it's a masterpiece. It's a very disturbing 10 twigs out of 10. Wow. Boom, boom, boom. 10 out of 10 twice. Mm. Surprising. Wow. Do you think? Really? Okay. Well, I well, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Well, it's one of those uh, once in a generation films, isn't it? Like we were mentioned that it, it just cannot be replicated because the time that it was made, considering the advent of the internet and the infancy of found footage subgenre, it's a film that I'll always watch, and it's retained its power even like twenty three years on. The mm. tension builds, I think, masterfully well. There's nothing that could prepare you for that final image. And it's almost unbearable to watch that final scene as they are going down the stairs. And I remember thinking, what on earth are we going to find down here? And mm -hmm. I was terrified. Yeah. And it still sends shivers. Yeah. It is the best film in the found footage genre, in my opinion. No question about it. But it doesn't really have too much competition in that regard. No. But it's in the lineage of the great horror films. It's mm -hmm. one of the touchstones throughout the centuries. I have to give it a 10. Yeah. Nice. Lovely. Yeah. No other score for it. It's a no. it's a masterpiece, and and nothing, yeah. nothing will be ever made like it again. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Mm. So overall, the Blair Witch Project scores a huge thirty mm. out of thirty. Deserving, mm. well, obviously. Completely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going back on it now. <laughs> some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, people will not be happy that we've scored that no. full marks. Uh, well, I mean, the, the can't the can't, but I think we, it came out at exactly the right time and we were exactly the right age to see a film. They yeah, came absolutely. out at exactly the right time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Ooh, okay. If you enjoyed the show, please like the video, subscribe to our YouTube account and share with your friends and your socials as well. We would love it if you did. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Leave some comments in the comments section, positive for preference. If there are any movies that you'd love us to cover, <laughs> let us know in the Please comments. Nice good us. ones. Good ones for preference. Yeah. <laughs> Horror films are my favourite. No pressure. <laughs> and to support us, you can become an All The Right Movies Patreon supporter, gain access to bonus videos and hundreds of hours of exclusive podcasts. That really helps us out, guys. So if you can, we really would appreciate it. Additional and continued support keeps us going and helps us create this content. So yeah, anything you can do good. would be much appreciated. Yes, it would. And that is a wrap. We can mm. breathe a sigh of relief, hopefully emerge from the woods unscathed. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> what the fuck's that? <laughs>